In the previous two episodes, the Star Destroyer Avenger was forced to initiate an emergency hyperspace jump to escape destruction at the Battle of Endor. And due to some physics involving special relativity, it is flung thousands of years forward in time and into deep space where it finally finds the New Eden Star Cluster. The Star Cluster, consisting of thousands of star systems, is the setting for the massive multiplayer sandbox space game, EVE Online. Be sure to check out the two preceding videos linked in the description where the Avenger had to fight for survival in an aggressive environment full of dangerous capsuleers. We left off in part two where the Avenger found temporary safety in a station owned by the Amar Empire, where they were discouraged from undocking due to the inherent dangers of the star cluster. But Captain Harkov has been contacted by Admiral Dala, who has also arrived at the New Eden Cluster under similar circumstances. She has two Super Star Destroyers, including the massive Eclipse, and several Star Destroyers and support ships. Captain Harkov is ordered by Dala to rendezvous with her fleet, as she intends to carve out an Imperial presence in player-owned space, or Nullsec, as it is referred to in New Eden. Before I go further, I feel it is necessary to talk a little bit about the politics of EVE. One may say geopolitics or perhaps interstellar politics of large EVE Online player corporations and groups. The alliances have wars over territory, betray each other, spy, undercut, make amends, become best friends, betray again, ally with historical rivals, rinse and repeat. This makes for content unlike any other game. The actions of one person betraying their alliance can affect tens of thousands of players. I feel it is necessary to declare an apolitical affiliation. Whether you favor alliances such as Goon Swarm, Test Alliance, Brave Collective, Pandemic Horde, or Legion, Northern Coalition, or others, with some minor caveats, they all come and go, rise and fall, and have good and bad qualities. There is one alliance, however, the oldest alliance in existence in the game whose maintained principles of open space as long as no one causes trouble. They don't rock the geopolitical boat, they remain neutral in most major conflicts, and they are not expansionist. Although they are draconian in their implementation of their database of shoot-on-sight criminals, as my own character is in this database, they are open to people they consider lawful. They are the Curatoris Veritatis Alliance. They have strong ties to the Amar Empire, and control an area of Nullsec called Northern Providence. They have allowed Admiral Dalla to temporarily stage there, as long as the bulk of the Imperial fleet stays clear of the larger space stations maintained by the Alliance. As per the Avengers' orders, they are able to travel directly to Admiral Dalla's fleet through hyperspace, bypassing the Stargate network and possibly dangerous systems in Losec space. Harkov is surprised that such a sizable force had survived what had been the imminent collapse of the Empire. There are over 200 Star Destroyers, several hundred smaller escorts and support ships, and at the core of the fleet, two Super Star Destroyers, the Iron Fist, an Executor class, and the Eclipse. The Eclipse is a super weapon in and of itself, with its main armament being a small version of the Death Star Super Laser, with damage output capable of destroying other Super Star Destroyers with a single shot, or cracking a planet's crust rendering the surface a sea of lava. Admiral Dalla demands a meeting with Harkov. Harkov is brought to a vast chamber with an egg-shaped capsule at the center. He is directed to gaze upon an alcove to Harkov's astonishment. The dead corpse of Admiral Dalla is inside. The egg-shaped capsule in the center of the chamber opens. Various plugs are disconnected from the nude body that emerges. A woman, covered in strange fluid, walks down from the platform with no modesty. You're late, Captain Harkov. The woman is Admiral Dalla. Harkov turns to the corpse of Dalla, and it dawns on him what has happened. The mortal Dalla was dead. The new Dalla had undergone the capsule air cloning process. From her capsule, she could exert a level of fine control and efficiency over the Eclipse's systems, far greater than a standard crew. Dala asks Harkov for his honest opinion about her transformation into a capsuleer. Harkov expresses concern mostly about the lack of physical and psychological preparation normally required to undergo the capsuleer transformation. He also tells her that by extending her life indefinitely, 
there was little incentive to make the most out of a short life. He had been studying capsuleers, and he had noticed that many of them, not all but many, abandoned their most valued principles in favor of wealth, power, fame, glory, or worse, because they no longer had a life to lose. It was as if life was no more than a frivolous game to them. Dalla reassures him that she has been drilled with the principles and values of the Empire for all of her adult life. She admonishes Harkov that his mentor, Grand Admiral Thrawn, would have approved of her transformation, as the best way to defeat an enemy was to know them as intimately as possible. Plus, the technological advantages of being a capsuleer were obvious. Harkov declares that he will trust her judgment. Dalla immediately promotes him to Rear Admiral and gives him command of the Iron Fist, the other Super Star Destroyer. She then re-enters her capsule and the walls of the chamber ring out with Dalla's voice. Our first task is to remove dissent throughout the fleet. She tells Harkov that she has received intel that one Star Destroyer, the Divisor, intends to go native and join the Calvary State, a major power in New Eden. Dalla powers up the super laser of the Eclipse, and with remarkable ease aligns the massive Star Dreadnought with the distant Star Destroyer in the fleet and with a green flash, obliterates the Imperial battleship. Dalla's voice cuts into all comm channels throughout the Imperial fleet. She tells them that this is the price of betrayal. Any ship or crew who defects to any entity in New Eden would pay the ultimate price. There was only one Empire left, and Dalla was in command of it. Harkov is shocked that she destroys an entire Star Destroyer for the acts of the few in command. Dalla's command method, although different than Harkov's, is certainly effective in a cold way, but Harkov hopes that her actions are not influenced by her newfound immortality. Dalla reassures Harkov that she intends to start a careful campaign. There are two major Nullsec entities at the time, the Red Swarm, which included the Goon Swarm and allies in the Galactic Downspin regions or south, and the Panfam Coalition to the north. Both of these entities possess hundreds of titans, each of which could challenge a Super Star Destroyer. The Imperials would avoid attacking those entities for the time being. Instead, they would attack the neutral states to the east of the Providence Block, and the Curse, Scalding Pass, and Wicked Creek regions where no unified defense could be mounted. They had also been given one month by the Curatoris Veritatis Alliance to move out of their space, or the CVA Alliance could threaten the Imperials with their own titans. The campaign begins with small-scale skirmishes. Dala and Harkov know that they must learn the tactics and mechanics of space combat and the New Eden Cluster before their invasion begins. Luckily, Dala has brought with her upgraded TIE Fighters. Almost every Star Destroyer or Carrier now has shield-equipped TIE Defenders, TIE Avengers, and Dala's own equivalent to New Eden's advanced drones, the extremely deadly Shadow Droids. All of this is the result of the Maul installation where technological research yielded fruitful results. The doctrine of Dalla's fleet favors technological superiority over sheer numbers. The first skirmishes reveal important tactical data. These smaller fights between frigates and cruisers allow the Imperials to understand the combat mechanics and tactics of New Eden ships. They learn that many of the capsuleers are not combat oriented or they lack the disciplined style of communication skills that have been drilled into the Imperial Captains. Various parts of New Eden show great variation in tactical skills. Some organizations were strong on the individual small scale, while others had sheer numbers with a lack of individual combat skills. On rare occasions, Capsuleer Alliances had both powerful tactics and significant numbers. The Imperials would avoid instigating such Capsuleer Alliances. The hyperdrives of the Imperial ships allowed hit-and-run incursions deep into enemy territory, where the response to their attacks were clumsy. By this method, the Imperials kept their opponents off balance. All goes according to plan until the whole of New Eden begins to hear about the Imperial ships making incursions into Nullsec. For the adventure and glory, more third-party Capsuleer entities begin to seek a piece of the action. Some Capsuleers actually assist the Imperials in their efforts, while most prefer to just shoot at them. Everything changes when a Keepstar, a type of citadel or massive space fortress comparable to a Death Star, is deployed near the scene of the conflict. 
The Space Fortress is open for use by almost all Capsuleers, but closed to the Empire and any Imperial allied Capsuleers. Dala and Harkov see the Keepstar as a clear means to attack the Empire, as large ships such as Titans and Dreadnoughts could use the space station for staging purposes. To succeed in their campaign, the Imperials must attack the Keepstar and destroy it before several Capsuleer Titans arrive. Harkov would prefer to fall back and study the situation before attacking. Admiral Dalla decides that there is no time. They are already committed to the campaign, and they must attack immediately. There are challenges, however. New Eden shield and armor technology has evolved to a point where certain space stations are able to stay in an almost invulnerable state for long periods of time. Only certain windows of vulnerability open, lasting for several hours, about every week or so. But the Capsuleer allies of the Empire set up firing tests against smaller versions of these citadels. The super laser of the Eclipse has equivalents in the New Eden cluster, but it's still quite different from the Doomsday devices used by the New Eden Titans. Firing tests of the Eclipse's super laser indicate that it can bypass most of the invulnerability fields that protect the New Eden stations. The super laser takes time to charge and it cannot outright destroy a keep star with one shot, but it can put the space fortress into a vulnerable state. Admiral Dalla gathers the entirety of the Imperial fleet and conducts a surprise attack on the keep star. The star destroyers and support ships are able to easily fling the standing defense fleet aside. No one expects an attack while the keep star is in an invulnerable phase. The super laser of the Eclipse is able to severely damage the Keep Star with its first shot, and the assault begins. Even with all the firepower of the Imperial fleet, the Keep Star shields and defenses are substantial, and it may take hours, even days, to completely destroy it. The local major alliance powers, except CVA of course, begin to slowly awaken from their slumber. Capsuleer fleet commanders are alerted or bat-phoned. Reconnaissance from the stealth scouts are fed to these fleet commanders, and they must now begin rallying hundreds if not thousands of Capsuleer captains into the fleets to counter the attack before the Imperials are able to destroy the Keep Star. The Keep Star does have potent defenses of its own. The Doomsday device, although slow to charge, is similar to the Eclipse's super laser. It fires and destroys or severely damages several Imperial ships. Also, small squadrons of corvette-sized stealth bombers make bombing runs on the Imperials, and the massive bombs are effective in some pockets of the Imperial fleet, but it's not enough to inflict severe damage. Harkov soon spots indications that a real attack is about to take place. When interdictor ships arrive and deploy several warp bubbles around the perimeter of the Imperial fleet, these warp bubbles are capable of preventing warp drive, and unfortunately for the Imperials, it is almost impossible to hyperjump through them. They are the equivalent in effectiveness to the Empire's own interdictor cruisers. Suddenly, a Sinocero field appears at the vanguard of the Imperial fleet. Sinocero fields allow New Eden ships to use their own equivalent of hyperdrive. It requires the activation of the field and then a capital ship jump drive to activate a jump bridge which will bring a fleet in. The first major Capsuleer fleet arrives. At its core are three Avatar-class Titans, massive ships rivaling the size of an Executor-class Star Destroyer. They are supported by hundreds of battleships, battlecruisers, cruisers, and frigates. Other than the Titans, Dala and Harkov agree that this fleet is not using any particular discipline doctrine. Dala decides to challenge it rather than retreat. Dala is able to expedite the recharge time of the Eclipse Super Laser align her great star dreadnought to the closest Avatar Titan and fire. The blast rips through the Avatar's armor and shields and penetrates to structure. The Capsuleer Titan smolders with severe damage. It will take some time before the Eclipse's super laser can recharge, but the three Titans respond by firing their own doomsday weapons, massive super lasers, at the Eclipse. The result is the shields of the Eclipse are taken down to about 60%. In time, the Titans would destroy the Eclipse, but not yet. The Capsuleer's carriers send elite fighters into the fray, and the two fleets lock horns. Chaos ensues as Thai advanced and shadow fighters counter the New Eden fighters, 
Star Destroyers slug it out with Megatron, Typhoon, and Apocalypse-class battleships. Capsuleer frigates are often mopped up by the fast-tracking lasers on Raider-class corvettes and Lancer-class frigates. Moros and Nagalfar-class dreadnoughts are able to efficiently kill Star Destroyers, and the Iron Fist and Eclipse counter with heavy turbo lasers that cut through the Capsuleer dreadnoughts. Meanwhile, the Avatars recharge their Doomsday devices more quickly and reduce the Eclipse's shields further. But the Capsuleer fleet is undisciplined and ragtag. Even though dozens more Capsuleers arrive by the minute, the Imperials are able to hold it together. The Eclipse's super laser is finally at full recharge, fires, and obliterates one of the Avatars. Suddenly, the Capsuleer's fleet commander requests communication with Admiral Dalla. Dalla's curiosity is unable to contain itself. The Capsuleer's communications are openly broadcasted across the local comms channels. Admiral Dalla, he says. So, trying to be a Capsuleer, eh? Dalla responds with, What do you want? I am busy destroying your fleet. The Capsuleer laughs and tells her that she doesn't know what she's doing. She has only the Capsuleer skills to fly the Eclipse and nothing else. He asks her how long she has been a Capsuleer. She tells him it's irrelevant, as she would soon be killing him. He reminds her that he will still be alive, even if he loses, and that, that he had been a Capsuleer for ten years, while she couldn't be more than a few weeks old. She was a noob, a scrub, a nobody with a big toy, and when the big toy was destroyed, she would be made to feel like a fool. Dala cuts the channel, locates the fleet commander's command ship, and starts the Eclipse on a collision course. Ramming was something the Eclipse is designed for. Harkov expresses concern that the Eclipse is breaking formation. Dala snaps at Harkov and tells him to mind his own command. Before the Eclipse is able to reach the command ship, dozens of stasis grappler devices come into range of the Eclipse and slow the massive star dreadnought down to a speed of mere meters per second. Two more sinusural fields appear in space, one near the Keep Star and the other near the Capsuleer Dreadnoughts. The first fleet to jump in near the station consists of two more Titans and a fleet of Macario-class battleships, supported by Guardian repair ships and several other support ships. The next fleet to appear near the Eclipse were three more Titans, hundreds of Typhoon-class battleships, and Tengu-class strategic cruisers. Harkov sees the writing on the wall and sharply orders the fleet to begin calculating a jump to hyperspace. The Eclipse is hit with several Doomsday device shots, and Dala does not respond to communications. Harkov takes command of the fleet. He then notices that the fleet near the station belonged to a different group than the one attacking the Eclipse. One fleet belongs to Pandemic Legion, Pandemic Horde, and Northern Coalition. This is the Panfam block of the New Eden Capsuleer Alliances. The other fleet consists of Goon Swarm, Test Alliance, and Red Alliance, the Red Swarm block of powers. These massive fleets were on opposing sides. All hell breaks loose when the Eclipse finally goes down, and the Imperial fleet finds itself in the middle of these two great New Eden fleets. Harkov must find a way out. The assault on the Keepstar is a failure. While calculations to hyperspace are in progress, Harkov orders the fleet into a tight formation with Raider-class corvettes, Lancer-class frigates, and Carrot cruisers at the spearhead. The smaller ships are ordered to move forward at haste and remove the interdictors such as the Arises and Sabres, destroy any deployed warp bubbles, and clear an opening to hyperspace. The Imperial fighters are also instrumental in clearing an opening. The plan works at the cost of dozens of frigates. Hyperspace calculations are complete. Harkov turns and looks at the burning hulk of the Eclipse. He knows Dala is alive, somewhere. But she was not human by Harkov's standards any longer. She was something else. He orders the fleet to jump to hyperspace. The Imperials arrive in a system only accessible via wormhole. Entries into the system are aggressively scouted and guarded. After several days of repairs, Harkov addresses the fleet. He tells them that they will use the system as a base perhaps erect a citadel station of their own. They will learn the ways of the New Eden Cluster, but make no attempts at incursions for some time. They would rebuild, acquire wealth, new technology, and perhaps one day re-emerge, but not now. Harkov is approached by his executive officer and is told that they do have the ability 
to create Capsalir clones, and that perhaps Harkov himself could undergo the procedure so that he may benefit from all the advantages. Harkov thinks about the many thousands of lives that have been lost. He says, no, no, that's not for me. Life is not as real when you have nothing to lose and if you cannot die. As this series wasn't planned, I have other unfinished YouTube projects to complete, but I am sure I'll be doing more Eve videos in the future. Thank you so much for watching. If you want some Eve Plex or game time, it's available from the link in the description. And I really appreciate all your shares, subscriptions, likes, amusing comments, and even just views. Keep evolving, space friends. Eve-volving. Get it? Laters.